Hi everyone, today we are talking about nerves and hormones. Now, being large multicellular creatures, certain parts of our bodies need to talk to other parts of our bodies. So for example, if I stand on a pin, the muscles of my leg need to know about it in order to respond. And this coordinated response of pulling your leg away requires nervous communication. This diagram here shows a reflex arc. Now these reflex actions occur when the safety of an organism requires a really fast response, like quickly putting your hand away from a hot pan. So we've got an example here. We have receptors in the skin, which detect the temperature change. We have a sensory neuron where the action potential or the electrical impulse moves up the sensory neuron into the spine, into the CNS, the central nervous system. It goes through this relay neuron back to a motor neuron and into an effector and effectors tend to be muscles or glands. There is a condition called hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathy. Now, what do you think the symptoms would be of a, uh, a, a disease where the sensory neuron breaks down? So the sensory neurons breaking down, what would that cause? Well, it causes the sufferer to feel no pain. And before you think that sounds great, no pain, um, People who have suffered from this have half chewed their own tongues off, walked around on broken legs for days, plunged their hand into boiling hot water without even realising it. So they've really damaged their bodies quite badly. So it's not quite as great as you might, uh, might initially seem. Um, motor neuron disease. This is one that more people know about. It's a gradual breakdown of the motor nerves. And that means the brain cannot send messages down to the body. And the most famous sufferer of this condition is the world famous physicist Stephen Hawking. So here we are, we have a motor neuron. It's got a nucleus and the nucleus is surrounded by cytoplasm. And this cytoplasm forms a long fiber and this fiber is surrounded by a cell membrane. This long part is called the axon. Um, electrical impulses are carried down this nerve axon and they can be very long. As I said, they're for, they're for communication, they have to transfer information from place to place. And this is the one way that a nerve cell is adaptive. Um, it's got this fatty sheath around it, which speeds up the impulse. And you can see that the nerve ending is branched. It's branched so it can make contact with multiple other nerves, with muscles or with organs. Now, I just said that nerves can make connections. And this happens in places called synapses. So synapses are a junction. They're a junction between nerves or a junction between a nerve and a muscle. Um, these tiny gaps are very, very thin. They're about a thousand times thinner than a piece of paper. And how it works is this. The action potential comes down the presynaptic cell to the presynaptic uh, membrane, pre meaning before, before the synapse. And it causes these little vesicles, these little bubbles to fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release a chemical called a neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. There are lots of neurotransmitters. There's acetylcholine, there's dopamine, there's serotonin, there's lots and lots of them that do different things. Um, the neurotransmitter molecule diffuses across the synaptic cleft, uh, bonds to a receptor molecule in the postsynaptic membrane, causing the action potential to carry on firing. And it doesn't just sit there. The neurotransmitters don't just sit there on the receptors causing firing continually over and over again. That would be bad. So what happens is they're broken down by enzymes. So acetylcholine is broken down by acetylcholinesterase, for example, and they can be reabsorbed back into the presynaptic cell via things called reuptake channels. This diagram here, you can see these reuptake channels. And you can see that some of this neurotransmitter is being recycled. One reason that cocaine, for example, can have the effect of making a person feel euphoric is because it blocks the dopamine reuptake channels. Now, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is responsible for that happy feeling you get when you sink your teeth into a donut or you hear a funny joke. It's kind of a happy uh, neurotransmitter. So if it sticks around in the synaptic cleft because the reuptake channels are blocked, it's going to continue to fire this euphoric feeling again and again and again. And that's why you get the euphoric feeling that you do with cocaine. Um, now, the trouble is the synapse can adapt to this, which is why drug takers often need to take larger and larger doses to achieve the same effect. So to summarize, nerves are 
fast. They have to be to have survival value. They're also specific. So removing my hand rapidly from a sharp object only involves my arm muscles. It's not a body wide event. Being long and thin means they can transfer information over relatively large distances and the branches enable them to communicate with other nerves, muscles or organs. Uh, they join together at things called synapses and these synapses will allow the impulse to pass from one cell to the next via neurotransmitter molecules. So that's pretty much that's a breakdown of uh, nerves. So let's move on to hormones. What are hormones? Hormones are chemical substances that help us to regulate processes in the body like growth, like fertility, like blood sugar levels, like blood water levels and so on and so on. They're secreted by things called glands and they travel to their target organs in the bloodstream. And this diagram here shows the hormones released from um, a gland called the, the uh, pituitary gland, the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. And this diagram also, also shows you some of the target organs that they act on. Here are some of the major hormone producing glands or endocrine glands. And let's talk about one that you are probably familiar with, which is the flight or fight response. Have a look at the adrenal glands just above the kidneys. Well, they secrete adrenaline and noradrenaline, and they have a body-wide effect. So what they'll do is they'll increase pupil dilation. They will shut down your digestive system. This is why you get the butterflies in the dry mouth, because your digestive system shuts down. They'll cause the major effect is a redistribution of blood to the muscles for the flight or fight response, increased heart rate increase breathing rate to get more oxygen to your muscles. This prepares you for the flight or fight. You're either going to fight your way out of a situation or you're going to run. Um, and both of those things need a large distribution of blood to your muscles. So this is the hormone that's responsible for that. This diagram here shows what happens if we have too little water in our blood. Now, if our blood is not watery enough, you haven't had a drink for a long, long, long time, you're super thirsty. This is detected by cells in the hypothalamus, which sits just underneath your brain. And it sends a message to the pituitary gland saying, release ADH. Now ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. Now you might know what a diuretic is. It's a drug that makes you produce lots of dilute urine. So an antidiuretic does the exact opposite. It sends a message to the kidneys telling them to reabsorb as much water as possible. OK, it's saying there's no water left in our body. Quick, reabsorb it back. Don't pass it as urine. Reabsorb it back into the body. Obviously, if you have too much water in your blood, the body stops secreting ADH and you get the opposite effect. Finally, let's talk about blood glucose levels. Last example. Um, so we've got too much sugar in our blood. You've just had yourself some sugary food and your pancreas produces a hormone called insulin. Insulin has the effect of taking glucose, clicking it together, clicking glucose molecules together into a larger molecule called glycogen and storing that glycogen in our cells, mostly in the liver. And because of that, the blood glucose level goes down. The opposite effect, let's say you haven't eaten all day, your blood glucose levels drops, you're feeling, you're really feeling it, you're feeling tired, you're feeling dizzy. Um, your body stops producing insulin because you want to keep that sugar in your blood and it starts to produce a hormone called glucagon. Glucagon is produced by the pancreas. Now that does the exact opposite thing to insulin. It takes that glycogen from the liver, from the cells, and it unclicks all the glucose, takes it apart, and throws all that glucose back into your blood and glucose, blood glucose levels will go up. Um, these are antagonistic hormones. Antagonistic mean they do the opposite thing to each other. Um, so insulin and glucagon are antagonistic hormones which have the effect of regulating our blood sugar levels. So to summarize, hormones are substances that regulate processes in the body like growth, like blood water levels, blood glucose levels. They're secreted from glands, they travel in the blood and they act on a target organ. Hormone action is slower than nerve action and you can understand why now, because it has to journey from the gland to the target organ, it has to go through the blood, that's gonna take a lot longer. And also the effects are more general. So for example, adrenaline affects most of the body systems.
So there we go, ladies and gents. I hope that was useful. Here's some questions for you. Pause the video now. Have a go at these and then unpause it. And in about five seconds, the answers will show up. I hope that was of use. Thank you very much for listening.